Well, welcome. We're beginning to uh, start our new series for this year, or I mean this month anyway, through the next five weeks. We're going to be uh, hitting the uh, chapters of Romans, chapters 7 and 8. If you're unfamiliar with Romans 7 and 8, let me challenge you to take some time this week to read through them every day. It won't take you long to read through both chapters. But two of the most impacting chapters in all of Scripture, not that it diminishes the value of other Scripture, but I, I found as I've studied the Bible and when I hit Romans 7 and 8, transformed my world. It really did. And so the truth that, that we're going to discover from, from this series, I hope, will transform your life and ultimately set you free from some of the bondage that maybe you're living in as a result of sin. So let's jump right into it. Let me ask you guys a few questions as we get going this morning. How many of you have ever been frustrated with the fact that uh, you know you're not really as good a person as you, as you know you should be? Anyone ever struggled with that? Awesome. See, it's a safe place. We're all broken and busted up, aren't we? Like we can put on a good act, can't we? We can dress up the outside a lot. But man, we lay our head on our pillows at night and we know, we know we're not as good as we should be. You ever feel perhaps that God's just not happy with you? That God is maybe just frustrated with your complete inability to get it right? Like, how many of you have honestly felt like God's just, God's just totally frustrated with me right now? <laughs> right? Like, how could God be happy with me right now? I'm a mess. What happens is this, and this is, this is what I found to be true in my own life and I think true in most, most believers' lives, most people's lives, is we get to this point where we, we recognize that we're sinners condemned before God. And, and so whether it's, it's through a sermon or through someone witnessing to us or reading the Bible, we, we, we come to faith in Christ. And, and it's an amazing thing. Then the next day comes along, and what happens a lot of times is this. I know I'm saved, and I've, I've been saved by faith and grace, and that's an amazing thing. Now what? Like what, what, happens, what happens then in, 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 in the days that follow, in the life that follows, this, this thing we call the Christian life? And so we immediately tend to run into this mindset that says, I'm a Christian now, so what does a Christian do? Well, a Christian is supposed to do this, this, and this, and, and then a Christian is not supposed to do this, this, and this. And so now my whole life is wrapped up in in me doing certain things that Christians do and then staying away from certain things that Christians stay away from so that my life is now defined, my Christianity, my, what I believe is, is defined by what I do or by, by what I don't do. See, I grew up with a mindset that told me good Christians, if you're going to be a good Christian, you know, don't, don't go to rated R movies. Good Christians don't drink alcohol. Good Christians, you know, don't go to, you know, secular concerts. Good Christians don't do this, but, but good Christians are, they do this, 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 and this. And so my, my Christianity was, was wrapped up in what I did or didn't do. So my salvation was, was secure, and I knew that, but I, I felt that as, as I lived this life that if I was going to keep God pleased with me, if I was going to keep God happy with me, if I was going to, if I was going to keep the favor of God upon me, that I, I had to perform really well, that I had to base my Christianity and now my, my continual growth on, on what I did or, or what I didn't do. Unfortunately, that's what many people think being a follower of Christ is all about. Being a follower of Christ means, okay, I do this, this, and this, or not this, this, and this. As, as though my whole salvation, so what's the point of your salvation? Why did God save you? It's the point of the gospel, this good news that Jesus saves sinners. It's the point of that to take bad people and make them good people. Boom. Was that the point of the gospel? And, and, and I think the Apostle Paul in this text will argue that no, it is not. But that's what we tend to drift into. And so what happens is it actually kind of turns people away from the church because have you ever talked to someone that said, well, if I become a Christian, then I, 
I've got to give up all this. And, and well, there, there actually is truth to that. I mean, God does have a law, right? We're going to talk about that this morning. And, and God does instruct us on, on ways to live. We're going to talk about what that is and, and, and how that works in conjunction with the fact that we still struggle with sin. And that, that's where Paul goes in Romans 7 and 8. Kind of like, what do I do with this, this battle that, that I know I should live a certain way, but I'm saved and forgiven, and, and God has a better plan for me. And so we, we wrestle with the tension between what we know we should be and what we know we're not, and, and, and how does God look upon us if we're saved? And, 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 so, and so as we head into this, certain people will look at the church and say, I can't be a Christian because I've got this wrong with me and this wrong with me and this wrong with me. And I've heard this before from from people who aren't believers in Christ. They'll say, I just need to get my life cleaned up. I need to get some things in order. Then I'll get back into church. Then I'll come to church. Then I'll I'll try, you you know, listening to what you guys have to say. That's just a natural mindset. I've got to, I've got to meet God halfway. And then if I get some things cleaned up, then God will take care of the rest. Or those in the church that are followers of Christ, what we tend to do is we, we tend to pretend to be a lot better than we actually are. Because after all, if they knew the real me, they would want nothing to do with me. Because I still have a lot of sin that kind of is still gripping my life. Like anyone here have a past? That past ever haunt you? That past ever kind of reach out and grab you at times? Struggles, battles with sin, battles with relationships, right? But we pretend like everything's fine and good because, because after all, it looks like everyone else seems to have all of their stuff together, and if, if they knew how broken I was, maybe they wouldn't want anything to do with me. So what happens is we feel this guilt and I think guilt's the best word to describe it because I, I struggle with this myself. We feel this guilt about not being able to measure up. Like, I just don't measure up. I don't measure up to God's standard. I don't measure up to their standard. I mean, look at this person over here. I mean, that, that guy has his life together. Like, he's, he's serving and he's passionate and he's worshiping God. And, 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 and so when we compare ourselves to other people, sometimes one of two things will happen. We can feel really, really guilty that we're not nearly as spiritual as them. We're not nearly as, as, as passionate as them. We're not nearly as dedicated as them. And, and that produces a lot of guilt. Like, oh, man, I, I'm never going to be that awesome. Or you, you can look around and say, wow, I am a lot more dedicated to that guy there. I mean, he, hasn't, he only comes to church like, you know, every, once a month. Or, or I'm serving a lot more than most people in this church. I mean, I serve a lot and I read my Bible a lot. And, and some of us that are a little more able to discipline ourselves to do certain things that are right, we, we tend to look upon ourselves as though we're maybe a little bit better. That's the temptation. And, and, and we can be filled with a little bit of pride and look down on those who aren't nailing it like we are. Either way, it's, 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 it's like a chain that can bind you, that can hold you back from really, from really experiencing the joy and the full life that God intends for you to enjoy in the gospel. So from this text today, we're going to see one thing, that you're set free from all of that. You are set free from having to perform well for God so that God will be happy with you. You are set free from having to compare yourselves to other people hoping that you'll measure up to them. So we do this a lot, right? Well, they'll expect this from me or I have to act a certain way around this person because they're, you know, they, they have certain values or whatever. What happens and what we're going to see from this text, you're set free from the guilt of your past. You're set free from the fact that you still struggle with sin. Listen, listen. I get it. You still struggle with sin. I get it. You know how I know that? Because I do. This week I did. And you did too. And so what we're going to see from this text is we're set free from, from all of that, from, from feeling like we don't, have, we don't measure up, from feeling the weight of the guilt of knowing that we're, we're not getting it right, from, from knowing that we're not as good as other people may think we are. Like we put on a good show, but we lay our head down on our pillow at night and we realize that our lives are a mess 
How many of you have ever known someone in the church that, that their lives just kind of blew up and you were shocked because you're like, oh my goodness, I had no idea. I thought they had every, I thought everything was great in their lives. I thought they were doing great spiritually. And then marriages blow up, personal uh, issues in their lives blow up, secret sin is exposed. But we can be set free from the guilt of our past and the guilt that hits us right now knowing that we don't measure up. We're set free to pursue Christ. And so go to Romans chapter 7. And let me read verses 1 through 6. It says this, Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law? Now let me stop there real quickly because we introduced a word that I, I, I want us to all understand and be on the same page in defining. It's this word law. So Paul is saying, as he's writing to the Roman believers, I am speaking to those of you who know the law. So what is the law? The law are those Old Testament rules that God gave his people to follow. So, so think Moses on Mount Sinai, God coming to him and giving him the law on stone tablets. And we see it kind of boiled down to the Ten Commandments, right? So when I say Ten Commandments, everybody knows what we're talking about. Don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't take the name of God in vain, don't covet, don't kill, right? So, so we're familiar with, with those laws that God gave. And so Paul's writing to people that know the law. They know right from wrong. They know God's standard. And God's standard is what? What is God's standard, by the way, in keeping the law? Do your best, try your hardest? Mm-mm, mm-mm. God's standard is obey it perfectly. Absolute perfection in obedience. God says, this is my standard. Anything less violates the holiness of God because he's a holy God. So, so you see the problem, right? So Paul's saying, I am speaking to those of you who know the law. You know it. You get it. You understand it. Look at that law. Who can fulfill it perfectly? Who obeys it perfectly? Can you? No. I know that. On my best day, I come woefully short of fulfilling the law. So he says, I'm speaking to those of you who know the law. And so this was, this was God's covenant with Israel. So we talked about the old covenant. The old covenant was this, given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Here's the law, Moses. Here's the law, Israel. Obey it perfectly. Obey it. Obey the law. Keep the rules, Israel. Moses, tell the people, keep the rules. And if they keep the rules, the covenant blessings will fall upon them. They'll be able to remain prosperous in the land. If they forsake the law, then the covenant curses will fall upon them. I'll remove them from the land and I'll judge them and oppress them. So so, so this is the old covenant where Israel swears before Yahweh in the Old Testament, all of these things we will do. You ever, you ever made a promise to God before? How many of you ever made a promise to God? God, I, I promise I'll do this. How many of you ever broke that promise? Yeah, welcome to Israel in the Old Testament. Yeah, God. I mean, they swore and they sprinkled the blood of the goat on the, on the people as, as, as a ratification ceremony saying, we will do this. How long did that last for Israel? Her history in, throughout all of the Old Testament is one of mostly disobedience to God, forsaking Him, pursuing idols. But isn't that the story of our lives too? Disobedience, forsaking God and pursuing our own idols? So we know the law. So Paul's saying to you, I'm speaking to you. You who know the law. You who know God's requirement. That the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by the law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Let me read through verse 6 and then we'll explain the text. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law. Keep that that verse in mind, that, that phrase, you have died to the law. That's really important. Through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. 
For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we may serve in the new way of the Spirit, not in the old way of the written code. So, what we're going to see from this text is this amazing truth. You are set free from the law. You are set free from the law's requirements to be perfect. The law says, obey, 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 obey it perfectly. And what Paul says is, you're set free from that. But what happens is this, okay? We have to understand what the law does. Because if you go to verse 5, what does it say? We're, while we were living in the flesh, so, so talk, think, think pre-salvation, pre-gospel, living in the flesh. <coughs> Pardon me, I've been struggling with a cold this week. He says, for while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. And so what happens is this, is is Paul says, if the focus of my life is is rule keeping, if the focus of my life, if the purpose of my Christianity is to to keep the rules that God has set forth, if that's the purpose or the reason for which God saved me, that's going to produce a lot of frustration and a lot of guilt that's going to hinder your growth actually. Because the law cannot produce life, only death. Why? Because it arouses our sinful passions, okay? Um, How many of you, if there were no speed limits? (laughs) Wow, I I didn't have to, that's all, that's just, I just had to go there and everyone, right? Like if there were no speed limits, I mean, I mean, you would be gone, right? I'd be there with you. But then you see 25 miles an hour. You have a law. <laughs> you exceed that speed limit. What, what do you become automatically? You become a lawbreaker. Right? So what's the, uh, what's the highway in Europe where you use no speed limits? Is that the, the Autobahn? The Autobahn. No law there, right? No law for how fast you can go. You can go as fast as you want. You can't get pulled over. You can't get arrested for speeding. Why? Because there's no law that says don't go this fast. So what happens is, is where there is no law, there is no, there's no, there's no breaking of the law. So when God comes down and says, my morality, my holiness dictates that you live this way, all of a sudden there's a law. And then we are men and women who have a who have a flesh, we have a mind and we have a body, and we're born with a sin nature. And when that law comes in contact with our sin nature, what happens? Rebellion. But I want to do this. God says, no, 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 don't. But I want to, God. God says, no, 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 don't do this. But I want to. And there's not a man or woman that's ever lived other than Jesus, and we'll get to that, who has ever, ever been able to meet the law's requirements. Why? Because the law stands over us and it condemns us. The law encounters our flesh and what happens is death. Why? Because we can't keep it. God says keep it perfectly. Boom, day one, we're, we're out. We can't do it. And even when we think we are, we realize that we're not. And Jesus illustrated this on the Sermon on the Mount when he says, you've heard it said unto you, and he goes back to Old Testament law, and he says, do not commit adultery. And there's a lot of us in here that could say, never committed adultery. Look how awesome I am. I rocked that one. And then Jesus says, but I say unto you, whoever looks on a woman with lust has committed adultery in his heart. Okay, who gets by that one? Right? Right? So so the law is not just an external actions, but it's also internal motivations, internal hearts. So what happens if if we live a life that is solely surrounded by trying to keep the law? It binds us. And, and, And Paul uses that word, it's binding on you. It's like a chain. And every night you go to bed, the law says, guilty, 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 because nobody can keep it. We fail almost every day, don't we? 
And then we wake up, I'm going to do better. How many of you have ever committed to God you're going to do better? I have. God, I'm going to do better. How, let me ask you, how'd that go for you? I'll pull the Dr. Phil on you this morning. How's that working out for you? Like, I've, I'll be honest, okay? I'll be, I'll be real transparent with you. I've made, I've made commitments and promises to God that I will never do that again. And like a week later, God, I know I promised, but never again. And, and, and then with certain sins that I've struggled with, let's take one like, like anger. Anyone have anger issues in here? Safe place. I got a couple anger issues. I've, I've put some holes in some walls over my years, right? Any wall punchers out there? Okay, all right. All right me and Gary, we'll talk about it. I'll, t- I'll try to spackle those. I became a pro with that. So um, I've, I've struggled with, with temper, anger. Some of you have too, you know what that's like. And, and you can be really feeling really spiritual and then one thing can happen to make you mad and then you're done. And then, and then you, you just realize the carnage that you leave behind you when you lose your temper and you get angry with people. You hurt people, there's pain, there's brokenness, holes in walls. Oh, God, I, I need to do better. I will never lose my temper with my kids again. Do, listen, if you're a new parent, don't ever make that. Okay. Just don't. Just don't. Okay. Man. And so what happens is, over a period of time, we realize that we can't do it. And we feel really guilty. Like, I can't do it. Have you ever been there? It's like, God, I, I'm done I'm done trying. I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, I'm done. I can't, I can't do it, God. And this guilt wrecks us. It absolutely wrecks us because we know we don't measure up. And this is exactly what Paul is talking about when he says, if the law is binding you, It'll produce death and guilt, and it'll kill you. So what's the solution? You've got to be set free, right? You've got to be set free from the law telling you you haven't achieved. You've got to be set free from the law standing over you saying, you're not good enough, you haven't arrived, you'll never make it. You've got to be set free from the guilt of the past. You've got to live beyond that guilt of the past, and you've got to be able to live beyond that guilt of the present struggle with sin that tells you, I'm not good enough. You've got to go beyond that. And how is that possible? By understanding this, that you have died to the law. So if you go back up to verse uh, 2, you're going to see that when we die to the law, we're set free. We are set free from all of that for the purpose for which Christ saved us, and that's to be joined to Him. So that the point of your life as a Christian is not to be a good law keeper. That's not the point. God didn't save you so that you could turn around and just keep rules and keep law and try and make God happy by keeping the law. God saved you so that you could have a a union with him wherein he would set you free from your guilt, wherein he would satisfy you, wherein he would be that which is most beautiful to you, wherein Jesus would be the one that gives you joy, that gives you the peace, that gives you the strength to endure the challenges of life. So what does he say? In verse 2, he says, for a married woman, and, and so he starts, he starts talking about marriage. He says, he says, a married woman is bound by the law to her husband while he lives, right? Married people out there, raise your hand. You're, I'm, I'm sorry, you're bound, right? Now, I know we live in a culture where divorce is like, you can get a divorce for whenever and wherever you want, but biblically, scripturally, okay, before God, I'm sorry, you're stuck, whether you like it or not. And you might be sitting here and say, but I married crazy and I didn't know it. I'm sorry, that's God's will for your life. You're bound to that individual, to that husband, to that wife. You are bound to them. What is the only way you can be released from that marriage? Well, the Bible says, and and, and killing them is not the answer, okay? (laughs) 
That, that it, did I hear someone say that? Did someone say, we, we, yeah, we, we need some counseling. We have a counseling minister. I'll give you Ron's phone number. No, I mean, wow, we, so, let me just read, the, I'll let the Bible, I'll let Paul speak. He says, if, 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 if the woman leaves her husband whilst they're married, she'll be called what? Verse three, an adulteress. So if she, if she leaves and lives with another man, adultery, right? But if her husband dies, not by her own hand, okay? So let's just clarify that right now. He dies. She is what? What's the word? Free. She's free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. So if a woman is married to a man and he dies, she is free to be joined to someone else. So the point of this text is not to talk about marriage, but it's to talk about the Christian's relationship to the law and to Christ, because then the point of this text is verse 4. Mark this verse if you mark your Bible. Likewise, my brother, in the same way, my brothers, you also have died to the law. How? Okay, hold on, hold on a second. Paul just made a really big statement. He said, you died to the law. You've been set free from the law's requirements. The law doesn't stand over you and condemn you anymore. The law doesn't tell you you're not good enough anymore. The law doesn't say, hey, because you failed and you're guilty, you're gonna, you're gonna be judged. The law doesn't do that anymore. That's what it means to be dead to the law. You're set free from the law condemning you. You're set free from the law creating guilt in you. You're set free from all of that. How is that ha possible? Well, Paul tells you, you have died to the law through what? Through the body of Christ. So what happens is this amazing truth. Christ releases us from the law by fulfilling it perfectly for us. Listen, the law says be perfect, doesn't it? God's old covenant command to Israel was fulfill it perfectly. When they couldn't, what did God supply for them? A sacrifice that would take the, the curse. So then Jesus came. And there's a term in theology we call active obedience. Jesus' active obedience was this. He, every single day of his 33 years on this earth, fully and perfectly kept the law of God. Every single day. And where you and I fail miserably, Jesus succeeded amazingly. He lived it perfectly. And then we have a term we call passive obedience, that when he hung on the cross, he took the curse and the punishment and the wrath that should have been upon you. He bore it. So that men and women who by faith in Christ come to him are set free from the requirements of the law. Why? Because Jesus, as their substitute, as our substitute, fulfilled it perfectly for us. He did. He, filled, he fulfilled it where we failed. Justification is this. It's God declaring you righteous. You know what's amazing about that? How many of you are righteous? Raise your hand. I know Gary's not. <laughs> he raised his hand. We're not righteous because we sin, most of us every day, right? Yet in spite of the fact that we still sin, when God looks upon us, what does He see? Does He see our sin? No, He sees the perfect righteousness of Jesus. That's the essence of what Paul's talking about here. That's what it means to be dead to the law. 
That when God looks upon us, he doesn't see Doug who lost his temper and Doug who, who um, committed this sin and Doug who committed this sin. When he looks at me because of my faith in Christ, he sees Jesus' perfect living, Jesus' act of obedience, his every day living perfectly. He sees that covering me. We call that being clothed in the righteousness of Jesus so that, so that my life that I live, which is marked by sin, does not condemn me because Jesus' perfect righteousness covers every single one of those sins so that I am justified, I am declared righteous. It's a legal term where the judge looks at you and says, even though you're guilty, I declare you to be righteous, not because of what you've done, but because of what this man has done for you. And so we're free from the law. We're set free from that. And so our death to the law makes it possible then to be joined to Christ. So if you look at the text, verse four, it says this, likewise, you have died to the law, through the body of Christ. So Christ has made it possible for you to no longer be condemned by the law. The law doesn't condemn you anymore. Why? Because you have the perfection of Jesus and Jesus kept it perfectly. So why have you been set free from the law? What is the point of your salvation? What is the center of your Christian living? What is the point of it all? So that you may belong to another. Let those words sink into your heart. You have been set free from the law so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, to Jesus. What is it that you live for now? What is it that motivates you to do what you do? The fact that if I don't live a certain way, God's not going to be happy with me and I'm not going to measure up. Because I'm telling you, church, that will only produce frustration and guilt. Because you don't measure up. When people come to me and say, I don't know if I'm ready to, you know, jump into this ministry. I don't think I'm ready for this. And I look at them and I say, you're not. And I'm not either. But that's what grace is all about, isn't it? That God would take us in spite of our struggles and our weaknesses and say, no, 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 I love you anyway. I've taken care of your sin. Come as you are. Come as you are. I'll take it. I can handle it. I bled on a cross for it. And so now what happens with a gospel understanding is this. My life as a Christian is not about keeping the law. It's not. It's about my union with Christ. It's about my relationship with Him. It's about my pursuit of Him. It's about me finding Him glorious. It's about Him being the treasure that I chase after. Not the law. Didn't, Christ didn't save me to chase after the law, to chase after rule keeping. Christ saved me to pursue and chase after Him, to know Him to make Him my delight, to make Him that which stirs me, that which motivates me, to make Him the center of my life. And our tendency is to make the law the center of our lives. And then when we can't keep the law, we get frustrated and it produces guilt. And Christ says, I've released you from the requirements of the law. That doesn't condemn you anymore. I've released you so that you may belong to Him. And what does the verse say? In order that you may do what? Bear fruit. What is that? That's Jesus changing you from the inside out. That fruit is seen in law keeping. I mean, we're going to start it next week. Well, then is the law evil? Is the law bad? (laughs) Paul says in the rest of Romans, by no means. The law is the reflection of the character and the nature of God. The law is a beautiful and amazing thing, but you have to look at it in the right perspective. That those who love Christ... Those who have their gaze on Jesus say, Jesus, I, 
I can't, I can't keep the law, but I thank you that you kept it for me. I thank you that in spite of my struggles today, Jesus, you, you look upon me as though I've never sinned. I, I thank you that in spite of the fact that I, I failed you today, God, that Jesus, you embrace me and love me as though I'd never done any of those things. Jesus, I thank you for that. That produces an affection for Christ. That produces a love for Christ that begins to bear fruit. And that fruit bearing that Paul talks about in this verse, that, that, that fruit bearing is seen in the way you live. It's seen in the way you worship. It's seen in the way you love. It's seen in the way you treat people. Because what happens is this beautiful and this amazing thing. As we understand that our union with Christ changes us, what happens is the law begins to become fulfilled in us. And so I'll close with this illustration. Thirteen and a half years ago on this very stage, I entered a union with my wife. At that time, Steph Totero. And we had dated for almost three years, had been engaged for a year, and I was ready to get married. She was ready to get married. We were really, really, really excited about getting married. I mean, the ex- I mean we were just, we had saved ourselves for each other, and, and, and it, it, was, it was something we were so looking forward to. So the day came, July 20th, 2001, right here on this stage, place I'm standing right now. And uh, we went through the ceremony, we said the vows, we became married. We walked down this aisle, we head back to that back lobby. Imagine this, imagine if I say this, this to my wife, Steph, we're married now. You know what that means, right? Like we are, we're married, we're together. Guess what we get to do now? We get to keep vows for the rest of our life. How awesome is that? I mean, I'm so stoked about the fact that, that now we're married, I, I get to keep these vows to you every single day. I mean, every single day, I can't wait to just keep vows, keep vows, keep vows, as if the point of my marriage is keeping my vows to her. Now, did I make vows to my wife that day? I did. Is my sheer commitment to keeping those vows what is producing my marriage and holding my marriage together? If that was what was holding my, if my ability to make a commitment to those vows was holding my marriage together, I would not be married today, almost 14 years later. What's producing the commitment to the vows? The focus on the vows? Or the focus on the woman? I keep my vows to my wife best when my affection is toward her, when my love is toward her, when I chase and I pursue her. I don't have to worry about keeping the vows. I don't have to focus on keeping the vows. I'm being faithful. To, oh, I have a better... Fe-. No, why? Because I am focused on her. And this is what it means to be set free from the law. But listen, listen, church, Jesus wants to show you how incredibly amazing He is. He wants to show you how incredibly deep His mercy and His grace is. He wants to reveal that to you. That is, as you realize that you're set free, you don't have to, you don't, you, you don't have to worry about the guilt of the past or even the guilt of the current struggle with sin, but that Jesus accepts you as you are now, and, and in that, He changes you, and as you pursue Him, and I love the way the, Paul, the, the Apostle Paul says it in this text, that you may bear fruit. It produces this affection for Christ that runs deep, that your focus is Him, your passion is Him, your pursuit is Him. And then in that, what happens is the law becomes a really beautiful thing to you. Like you want it. Like like you want to chase after what God wants you to chase after. You want to pursue that which God wants you to pursue. Righteousness, holiness, godliness. You want that. And on those days in which you don't, you know that you've been declared righteous. And so today we've been set free. If you're in Christ, if you've come to Christ, as as you heard in these testimonies this morning, if you've come to Christ, you've been set free to be joined to Christ. Allow that freedom to just 
propel you to growth, propel you to service, propel you to worship, that when you come in here next week and you had a rough week and you blew it with your wife or you blew it with your kids or you struggled with lust, that you can come in this moment and know that God has saved you and removed your sin from you as far as the east is from the west and then you can lift your hands and voices and worship and receive from Christ the grace that is yours as a child of His. There's freedom because the chains are gone You can live beyond the guilt. Father, as we reflect on this text this morning, I pray that you would help those of us that are struggling with just wanting to make you happy by being good or by keeping the rules to realize that we will fail, but that you're not happy with us because we performed well for you this week. You're happy with us because of Christ. That when you see us, you see Christ. So my prayer is that we would pursue Jesus this week. That our focus would be not the law, but our focus would be Jesus, first and foremost. And Father, I pray for anyone in here that's struggling with whether or not they're still bound to the law. The law still condemns them, that today they can realize they can be set free from that condemnation and set free from those requirements because Christ fulfilled it for them perfectly. So save them and allow them even in this moment, Lord, to know that they can run to you as they are and find grace and hope and forgiveness. And I pray that you would work that miracle in lives even right now. In Jesus' name we pray.